Welcome, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to this special American Finance Association panel session on business and capital taxation. Uh, my name is Josh Rao. I'm the Orman Family Professor of Finance at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And it's a great pleasure for me to chair this session with uh, such an esteemed lineup of panelists whom I'm going to introduce very shortly. 2017 was an important year for business taxation. On December 22nd, President Trump signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 into law. This act introduces hundreds of changes to the U.S. tax code. Uh, and these are changes that pertain both to corporations and to individuals. This legislation also makes specific tax provisions for businesses that are organized not as corporations, but rather as pass-through entities taxed at the individual level, businesses such as sole proprietorships, partnerships, and S-corporations. Well, observers and policy analysts have debated many aspects of this legislation and its likely effects on growth and the distribution of income and wealth in highly public forums, such as the blogosphere and Twitter. And while I am sure that today some key points in that debate will resurface here, and in fact, some of you might feel disappointed with the show were that not the case, uh, I have actually guided our panelists towards what I hope will be a high-level discussion about business taxation, its purpose, its goals, and its ideal structure to achieve those goals. Um, you know, some of the topics that the tax policy debate has brought to the forefront are issues that uh, we as finance professors think about uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, they include how should the tax system deal with the coexistence of corporations and non-corporate businesses? How important is the treatment of uh, capital cost recovery, otherwise known as depreciation allowances for investment and growth? What is the optimal approach to designing international tax rules, given the challenges of identifying both the source of income and the tax residents of firms in an environment with mobile capital? What is the future of the interest deduction for both corporations and pass-through businesses? This is the American Finance Association, after all. And how can we ensure that tax policy creates an environment that is conducive to technological development and innovation? These are some of the key questions necessary to be able to evaluate any business tax policy, current legislation included. So today, we're going to have the opportunity to hear about these issues from three individuals whose expertise and policy experience in the field of business taxation should be truly inspiring. So I'd like to introduce the panelists here in alphabetical order. Uh, on my left, your right, is Alan J. Auerbach. He is the Robert D. Birch Professor of Economics and Law and the director of the Birch Center for Tax Policy and Public Finance, uh, as well as a former chair of the Economics Department at the University of California, Berkeley, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard University. He was the deputy chief of staff of the U.S. Joint Committee on Taxation in 1992 and has been a consultant to several government agencies and institutions in the United States and abroad. He's also served as the president of the National Tax Association, from which he received the very prestigious Daniel M. Holland Medal in 2011. He's worked on such topics as dynamic fiscal policy, generational accounts, simulation of fundamental tax reform, and destination-based cash flow taxation. Uh, for AFA members, I want to add a couple of notes. First of all, your education is not complete if you haven't read his 1979 QJE paper, Wealth Maximization and the Cost of Capital. If you think you understand that topic but haven't read his paper, you probably don't, so some recommended reading. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, Alan was uh, vital in helping to put this session together uh, and helping to uh, uh, line up such an esteemed group of panelists. So Alan, thanks very much and thank you for being here. Next in the uh, middle is Jason Furman. He is the professor of practice uh, of economic policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He uh, spent eight years as a top economic advisor to President Obama, including serving as the 28th chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from August 2013 to January 2017. During this time, Dr. Furman played a major role in most of the major economic policies of the Obama administration, uh, 
He had previously worked at the CEA and NEC during the Clinton administration, also uh, had uh, worked at the World Bank. In research, Dr. Furman was the director of the Hamilton Project and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He has conducted research and published journal articles in a wide range of areas, including and especially fiscal policy and tax policy. Uh, Dr. Furman holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Uh, Jason, thank you for being here. Finally, Kevin Hassett is the current, that is the 29th, chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Prior to becoming chairman of the CEA, he was an economist at the American Enterprise Institute since 1997, where he served as director of economic policy studies and resident scholar from 2003 through 2014. Prior to joining AEI, Kevin was a senior economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and an associate professor of economics and finance at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business. An expert in the field of public finance, Dr. Asset has authored articles in leading economics journals and has served as a columnist in leading media outlets. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Kevin, thank you for being here. So um, on to the main event. I am now going to recognize each of our panelists uh, for their prepared remarks for 20 minutes each. The order will be Kevin first in recognition of his current position, followed by Jason and then Alan. After that, we will have uh, 20 minutes of discussion up here in which each of you can react to or respond to what others have said. I will uh, lead this session, uh, this segment as moderator and may ask questions during those 20 minutes myself. And then finally, we'll have around 30 minutes of general questions uh, from the floor. So with that, uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. I'm going to thanks, Josh. Our, and, uh, slides up here. Get the slides up. And uh, Alan noticed a typo in my slides, which is that uh, we said it was for the American Economic Association, not the Finance Association meeting right at the top. But uh, apologize for that. Uh, but it's really a great pleasure to be here and an honor to be on the stage with uh, Jason and with Alan. Uh, if you go to the CEA offices, there's the legendary uh, CEA conference room that's named after our uh, Alan and my old dear friend, Al David Bradford. Uh, and they have the, the pictures on the wall of all the chairmen. I'll, I'll uh, if I guess if I'm not impeached, be the 29th uh, picture on the wall. Uh, which means that for all of history, I'll be uh, in a, a picture on the wall right next to Jason. Uh, and, and I guess that means that, that I'll be attractive by comparison for, for all of American history. Uh, but it's especially a pleasure to be here with Alan. Uh, if I uh, go into the Wayback Machine uh, and go to Philadelphia 1986, uh, we were in uh, McNeil Hall. Uh, studying public finance, uh, my classmates and I in graduate school at Penn. Uh, and our uh, young uh, professor at the time was this guy that Penn just stole from Harvard named Alan Auerbach. And uh, 86 was a pretty interesting year to start studying tax reform because of the 86 Tax Act. And uh, as uh, people know, who they follow the public finance literature, what happened to me really, uh, uh, which was quite formative about the 86 Act, was that when Alan and I started studying tax policy, or he studied before me, but when he started my study of tax policy, then there was this puzzle in the literature that uh, tax policy was changing all the time, uh, but it appeared to have no effect on capital spending, on business fixed investment. And um, for me, as an economist, it kind of became a real puzzle that didn't make sense to me. And I think that if you go back and look, that it, it could be that Alan and I wrote the first paper on the endogeneity of tax policy and how to fix it uh, econometrically. And it was still, I was like a third year graduate student and we published it in the Carnegie Rochester series uh, where we used the 86 Act as a natural experiment. And the basic idea was that our theory was that the cross-section variation in the user cost that happened because of the 86 Act was unintentional. The politicians didn't understand what they were doing. And so therefore it was an exogenous bit of variation. And when we used that, we got a user cost elasticity of about one. Uh, even though in the pre previous literature they were running time series regressions where the coefficient was always zero. That really sort of started me on uh, the path that I'm uh, still on today, uh, which is an economist who studies uh, taxes and capital spending. And so it's been a real distinct honor and a pleasure uh, to be in the middle of the tax debate uh, this year. Uh, I was uh, nominated uh, in the spring uh, and confirmed in September. 
And uh, Jason informed me that it's traditional for the CEA chair and others confirmed this to serve as a consultant uh, in the White House before confirmation, as long as you don't go to the office or, or you know, take too many of the trappings. So I actually started in early June. Uh, and uh, so I was there when Priebus was still the chief of staff and uh, there's been a lot of change uh, there, but I, I sort of feel like I've been honored to be in the middle of, of history. And so what I'd like to do is, is, is responsive to what Josh's instructions are, uh, talk about you know, business tax reform and how I think it ought to work, but given that we just did something, I wanna sort of use it as a metric of, uh, of that and, and uh, really a progress metric. And, and so, uh, Everybody here probably knows if they read uh, uh, in the news what happened, but we just changed the top statutory federal corporate tax rate from 35 to 21%. And something that you might not know about, and I know Alan has said that he wants to talk a little bit about, is that on the corporate side, there's a massive amount of international reform uh, that uh, moves us towards a territorial system, has deemed repatriation, which is kind of like a lump sum tax on people who've located profits from the past overseas and then a whole bunch of anti-base erosion rules that have weird names like guilty and beat uh, that make it so that it's much harder for people with intellectual capital to transfer price profits uh, offshore in the future. So we've got a lower rate, but it's meant to really bite more. Uh, and on the individual side, uh, we doubled the standard deduction uh, and had a whole bunch of marginal tax rate reductions, uh, some pass-through uh, things so that we don't create a big distortion between C-corp tax and pass-through taxes, uh, and uh, a number of popular deductions like the mortgage interest and charitable contributions have, have stayed. Uh, uh, as per the, the charge, I'm gonna focus mostly on the uh, corporate side. Uh, and, and, but before I do, there's one thing I just wanted to make clear about like how do, how do I think about the politics of tax reform uh, and uh, you know like what they spent money on, what they didn't spend money on, and, and, and so how is it that this bill after decades of failing, I know President Obama you know, had, had a pretty solid plan, 28% rate, uh, didn't make, make a lot of progress. So, so, so you know, in the end, there's a lot of things that happened um, to get a tax bill through. And, and so, so I like to look at the joint tax score and think about uh, what exactly we just did in terms of static and, and dynamic cash. And so you can see in this slide uh, that the total individual static cost is a little bit less than uh, 1.2 trillion. And uh, I've got the shaded area of the child tax credit there, uh, something that expanded uh, a lot in, in the uh, sort of last moments of the bill. Uh, and you can see that on the individual side, you know, about half uh, the static costs is the refundable, the big expansion to $2,000 of the child credit and the uh, refundability of it. On the corporate side, something that's kind of underappreciated is, and it's just in part because of the way the Joint Tax Committee makes tables, uh, so that the, sometimes it's covered that the corporate side costs 600 something billion. Um, out of, uh, and uh, so then, you know, and it's 600 and something of the 1.4, but actually they separate out the international tax reform and the uh, corporate reform into separate sections of their report. And the international part is, you know, 95% uh, uh, corporate stuff. And so I think if you're thinking about like, well, where do we spend the money? It's important to just bunch those two together. And if you do, you see that the, the static uh, cost of the corporate reform uh, is, you know, 300 billion ish uh, dollars. And so the total static cost is, is a little north of 1.4 trillion. Uh, and only 300 billion of that is the, the corporate side, which is sort of, again, the side that I spent my career studying. And now the Joint Tax Committee has a dynamic score that said that it's you know, a little bit north of a trillion. Uh, and uh, so if you think about the fact that the child credit, there's a lot of good argument for a child credit in terms of equalizing opportunity, uh, but it's probably not super impactful on economic growth. Uh, so you can see that the sort of the growthy parts of this bill probably did a pretty good job, even in the relatively conservative dynamic score of the Joint Tax Committee, of contributing uh, revenue feedbacks that help pay for the for the tax change. And so then um, I want to think about like so what's the background within which uh, this happened, and uh, you know what was motivating the administration and Congress when we were uh, developing this bill. And I think that the thing that jumps out uh, in the data to us when we look at the current recovery. Uh, is that there are lots of ways to do it. And this, I just show a peak to peak chart where we're not hopefully at the peak yet. 
<laughs> right? But, uh, but, but it's definitely been the case that it's something that, that folks have seen a lot of economists talk about, that uh, the ordinary workers just haven't been doing as well as they normally do in recoveries, even though the recovery is not looking that awful. Um, and certainly it's, it's, it's long in the tooth. There's been steady growth. And so if you look, uh, it, the growth in the median individual income in this recovery, which we uh, argue and uh, you know, we'll argue in some documents you see coming out of CEA uh, in the coming months, uh, is a good measure of how the ordinary guy's doing, that it's actually, uh, this is at annual rates, it's declined three-tenths of a percent a year uh, since 2007, going back to the peak right before the financial crisis. And so normally in a recovery, um, like if you look at the uh, the Clinton recovery, or we also had the dot-com thing feeding productivity, you know, you're getting a heck of a lot more real uh, median income growth than that. And so, so if you're going to say, is there something that really sticks out in post-war economic history about this recovery, it's that ordinary workers have had the worst recovery on record. Uh, and now, you know, we, we could conceivably have some really awesome wage growth going forward in which case we, we could catch up. But don't forget, you know, going from 07 to 16 and averaging 0.3% a year down, um, this is kind of a hard average to change after you've got all those years. And so the other thing that jumps out at me, so why do wages grow? You know, I, I, I uh, kind of old fashioned, I think that if you're going to have a higher wage, then you have to be more productive in some way. Um, and uh, that's not obviously true in the NBA anymore, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact is that, uh, that you can get more productive because of human capital investments, or you can get more productive because you have better physical capital. And one of the things that uh, Steve Braun, a career guy at, at uh, the CEA, does for us is when he gives us our charts to see how the economy is doing is, is he has this capital deepening chart where he does a centered uh, moving average uh, in order to help smooth out cyclical uh, factors. And, and uh, you know, so, so if you look at the wage change, you think, geez, that's kind of like a, a national emergency. There's this terrible uh, wage uh, problem that wages aren't keeping up. What might explain it? Uh, well, uh, if you look at this chart, you can see that capital deepening in the U.S. Uh, by, by this you know, five-year moving average measure went negative you know, in recent years it, it, you know, in what should have been like a good part of the recovery for the first time in U.S. history. It's a really sort of striking thing to see. And so uh, now, now there, there are ideas like, so why is capital uh, uh, deepening so low? Why is investment in the U.S. is so low? Well, there, you know, there's one view, which, which is definitely a view that, that's uh, you know, a null hypothesis worth exploring, which is that we're in some kind of weird new Keynesian world where we just don't have enough activity to get anyone to be motivated to invest in anything. Sure enough, interest rates are almost zero, so that's a low cost of capital, so guys ought to be investing. They're not. Um, that's, you can think about it maybe as like an island economy view of what's going on. Um, but there's another view, and this goes back to uh, stuff that Gosh, if you go through uh, yellow books at NBR and, and look at our back has it, we've got a lot of papers on the theory of this international tax stuff. Uh, but, you know, I know this is a finance group, not a public finance group, but, but, but I think one of the best uh, measures of the marginal incentive that the tax code has on, on uh, capital spending is the effective average rate. Uh, Spengel et al., a bunch of German authors, just put out an analysis of uh, the latest uh, corporate tax proposals. Uh, but the basic, you've heard people say, hey, we're the highest corporate tax place on earth. The effective average rate is basically sort of what the government takes away if you locate a plant someplace, and so it's a present value calculation. And the effective average rate in the U.S. by uh, Spengel et al.'s calculations, and this came out just in, in I guess, December, um, before the tax bill, was 36.5%. And, and if you look at this, this is just EU countries. It's like everybody in the left column is like about half that, right? And so, uh, and, and just for, if you want to have a mental note, so what did we do with the tax bill? Uh, well, we moved the effective average rate from 28th place to 18th place. All right, that, that's, what, that's what we did. And uh, the thought then is that the alternative theory about why we've got the worst wage growth of any recovery ever and capital deepening went negative for the first time in history is it's not about on or off investment decision. It's not that, oh, I'm going to buy a machine, interest rate's low, oh, I'm not going to buy a machine, and so they just decided not to buy the machine. It's more that they said, okay, I want to build a factory. Do I do it here or do I do it there? 
uh, and increasingly, we can see in the data that, that everybody's doing it there. And I know that these tables with rates and stuff can be hard to understand. And so I just wanted to, you know, our, our tax staff uh, did a nice little ex example uh, using the Spengel model. So suppose we have an investment that's going to give us $100,000. Um, then if we locate that in the law before the tax change um, in Ireland, you get to keep 85,900 of it. If you locate it in the US, you get to keep 63,500. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I guess we could have a show of hands, but is there somebody here who, like, would really rather have the 63,000 than the 85,000? You know, probably not. Uh, and so uh, I think that if you look at the literature, you can see that, that this kind of stuff has been very material. Uh, it's uh, moved a lot of activity all, all offshore uh, and can be partly an explanation for why capital deepening went negative for the first time in U.S. history. And then you can say, well, yeah, but how big a deal is it? Well, you know, I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it, but this is one way. Um, so, so in this recent NBER paper, the authors basically just hypothesized the following. They said, well, suppose that we had U.S. multinationals who are locating all this activity all over the place. Uh, and we just had them locate the share of profits in the U.S. that they have sales in the U.S., just like we do with state apportionment for taxes. Um, or you could also do it with activity. I mean, a number of different ways to do it. But the thing that's interesting is that, that they then show that because they don't do that, because they locate the activity offshore and then transfer price the profits there, uh, that um, that increases the trade deficit. It's, it's very interesting for, for, for NIPA aficionados. It's all inside the current account because the domestic, uh, the, the foreign sub, uh, but owned by the domestic parent, income goes up and the imports go up. Uh, and so, so GDP goes down, but all on the current account side. And this chart shows by their calculations that this game that we just talked about, which is why they wanted the sort of you know, 60 something thousand instead of the 80 something thousand has expanded so much that, uh, looking at the right chart, in 2016, about 51% of the American trade deficit was attributable to the transfer pricing of US multinationals to their foreign subs where they had their production. So if none of that happened, you would cut the deficit in half. Because it happened, the deficits double. So, so then, um, you know, we put out a bunch of analysis that says that we like, so there's basically, and, and you've written a lot about this, the intensive and extensive margin and the average rates are for plant location and the user costs that Alan and I played with are more for like buying more machines in an existing plant. And, you know, we've put out estimates that basically said that we think on the corporate side that you should get three tenths to five tenths more per year growth because that, that activity is coming back. We're not worried about having like a massive amount of crowding out because in part there's a lot of the activity that's explained by, within the current account by U.S. You know, guys with rents basically locating the rents offshore by locating the activity offshore. But you know, if you want to think about, because these tax changes are large, uh, well, maybe you know, th this is going to increase the deficit. Certainly, you know, some of the stuff that, that's on the individual side that's you know, less about dynamic effects could increase the deficit, and so then there'd be a lot of crowding out, and won't the crowding out just offset this effect? And um, first thing to think about on that is, it, it, we don't have enough time to go into all the modeling of this, but, but if we, we have reduced the subsidy for housing capital quite a bit by going to a big standard deduction, uh, and as we move, if you go to Dale Jorgensen's models, as you move housing, housing capital to physical capital, then that could be really good for growth, and we're abstracting. Uh, from that. And so if we're saying, well, if we're going to have crowding out, then how big an interest rate change do I need to get the user cost not to change? Because that's one way to think about the intuition of, like, what do I need to do to crowd this thing out that Kevin thinks might happen? And you can see this, in this calculation, we just went back to the Spengel model, and we just jacked, you know, typed interest rates in. They start with a 7% nominal discount rate, and, and that's the, the rate they chose. I would have maybe chosen a couple points below that, but yeah, whatever. They started with seven, and in order to crowd out the user cost change, the interest rate needs to go up 5%. Um, I, I was started doing these calculations because in the uh, joint tax score, they said that you know, basically aggressive Fed action would offset the positive growth effects for this. 
And I was wondering what kind of an interest rate effect do I need to stop the growth effects of this? And when I was doing user cost calculations, I got numbers like this. I asked the Joint Tax Committee to tell me what their interest rate assumptions were, and they, they declined. Um, and so I can't tell you what, what, what they, if they have some other channel. But I'm just saying that, that for me, I'm not so sure that, that I buy into the idea that I should have a high anxiety that the user cost effects are going to be crowded out by interest rate movements because the interest rate movements required are pretty large. But, you know, don't believe me, let's go to the videotape. Uh, Mertens and Raven, uh, 2013 American Economic Review, look at, um, they've got a, a really interesting, you've written a lot about this, you've written in this space, Josh, that they've got a uh, very interesting sort of hybrid macroeconometric approach where they use structural VARs plus, uh, you, you know, the, the Romer and Romer uh, approach, narrative approach. And uh, so they look at, in the US, US history, a shock, uh, a 1% shock um, to the uh, corporate tax uh, rate, average tax rate. And uh, in their simulation in the AER, they show that the corporate income tax base goes up statistically significantly, which means that, uh, you know, that stuff that they're moving over there, a lot more of it ends up over here when we lower the rate. Uh, corporate income tax revenues don't go down statistically significantly because they don't go up either. So it's not a, fr you know, a super free lunch, but, but, but there, there's no statistical impact on corporate tax revenues because the extra base offsets uh, it, historically the decline in the rate. And then you could say, so yeah, but uh, what happens with the other stuff and uh, government debt, they find there's no statistically significant effect on government debt of the corporate tax reform and they find that there's no movement in the federal funds rate. Uh, and so if you want to think about it, look at the sort of point for the federal funds rate, uh, the, the sort of peak effect, 95% confidence range. Uh, that point four would not be enough to anywhere close to crowd out the tax, user cost tax effect of this thing on growth. And so uh, to conclude, I think that uh, the, the U.S., we could talk more in the Q&A about consumption taxation and how this takes us in the direction of consumption taxation. But on the corporate side, we've been an outlier. Um, I think that because we've been such an outlier, we've been looking at almost a corner solution type world where wages have been declining, uh, capital deepening went negative, which means that there's more depreciation in the investment. Uh, and that happened not because of some kind of weird island economy macro thing, but rather because people decided to do stuff over there instead of over here. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, and we can see that even in like the apportionment stuff for the trade deficit. And so then like the final thing then is so, so what should we think about this going forward? Um, well, if you go back to October before the election, everybody said 2018 was going to like on average the bulge bracket firms or the big banks on Wall Street and we get this big database of everybody's forecasts at CEA so we can think about what everybody's doing. And they were saying 1.9-ish was what 2018 is going to be, and as of the beginning of this week, uh, most of them had worked in the impact of this tax bill on the economy, but other things too, of course, uh, and their forecast is now at about two and a half. Um, I expect that, that a month from now they're going to be above that too because some of the firms in the bracket haven't put in their tax effect yet, uh, and that revision is consistent with what we've been saying since the start of the tax debate. Uh, you know, we said GDP growth would be up three tenths to five tenths, uh, and uh, you know that's more than that. And again, there are there are other things going on. Uh, we didn't talk much about the individual side, but uh, Bob Barrow, uh, he and Redlick have a piece in, in 2011 that you can use to analyze in a similar way to Mertens and Raven uh, how the individual side would affect it. Mertens and Raven also is something you could use for that because they they also look at that side. Uh, and and Barrow wrote in the Wall Street Journal a very accessible description of what he gets if he does the individual side, which is that he gets about 0.8 percent extra growth this year from that. Um, but that's not the topic of, of this debate. But I didn't want to uh, stop with just the sort of growth thing. Uh, because I think in the end, uh, we have to go back to think about the, the chart that motivated why are we doing this, the negative wage growth. And, um, you know, you can write down whatever share, labor share you want, uh, but if you, you know, if you get an extra <coughs> half a percent of growth this year, uh, then that's going to be a significant wage increase this year that people are going to grow off of. Um, one estimate, you know, I asked people to do it a number of different ways for here, but one estimate is if the bulge bracket revision happens, then people get about an extra 600 bucks, uh, the median family this year. 
And then that 600 bucks is stuff that they'll continue to get, will grow off of that higher base, God willing, uh, and so that the cumulative amount of wage progress we can make because of this is, is significant. So thank you, Josh. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin, for those remarks. Excuse me? This guy. Next, we have Jason. Okay, well, thank you. Um, uh, wait, does this work? Is this working? It sounds like it's working. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for um, having me here, having me as part of this um, discussion. This is, as far as I know, the very first hearing on the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So I'm glad that we're glad that we're doing that. Um, the Josh wanted us to be forward-looking. I will get to being forward-looking as an afterthought once I do a whole bunch of backward-looking. Um, but I think some of the forward-looking is implicit um, in that. Um, it was really nice to hear Kevin's presentation, because I think there actually was an enormous amount um, in common. I began an awful lot of my presentations at CEA with how terrible median wages had been in this recovery. Um, I showed that chart of the decline of investment, um, the first time that capital services per hour have declined in the post-war period over five years. Um, constantly, I think that it's hard not to look at that and get obsessed over it. And I think that a large fraction of the decline in median income growth we've seen since the 1970s is because the productivity growth rate has slowed. That's been a more important factor than rising inequality, although rising inequality has been an important factor too. And there's another important question on which margin can we move public policy more, productivity or inequality, that I won't be um, discussing here. But regardless, I think we really do need to obsess over productivity growth. We need to obsess over the role of both the quantity of capital um, and the quality of capital, you know, which, which you could talk about innovation in that. The question is whether the law we just passed is going to help that or hurt that. And if it helps it, how much will it help it by? And um, uh, is one question. Then one other thing, just by the way, just briefly, is um, you know, we all know that taxes matter. Um, we all know there's a lot, a lot, a lot of other stuff that matters too. So if you look at investment, this is now switching to the OECD numbers. The United States has actually grown more than any of the other G7 countries, even though we have a higher corporate tax rate, even though our corporate tax rate change um, uh, was much smaller. You had some changes at the state level, which is why you see a negative number there. So, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff going on. I don't think you want to, and I don't think Kevin would either, point to just one five-year number and say that that motivates any particular um, policy change. So, people looked at this tax reform and came up with a variety of different numbers for its economic impact. And what was strange about that is often when you have these types of debates, you have different economists who have different elasticities, and often economists with more conservative inclinations have larger elasticities on tax, and um, economists with more progressive ones have, have lower ones. Here, everyone was using the same elasticities. For a lot of this, everyone was using the very same comparative statics model and coming up with very different numbers. And the question is, why? And what I'm going to argue is that a lot of that difference was just sort of you know, what you might even call um, sloppy errors, taking into a size, count the size of capital in the economy, as well as a really important thing, which Kevin was right in emphasizing in his presentation, is you can't just model one half of the tax plan. You have to model the whole thing. If I came up with a proposal that cut all tax rates in half, and now, though, you had to pay taxes on two times your taxable income, you couldn't do a dynamic score of that that just did the part where you cut the tax rates in half and you looked at the macro of that and ignored the other part where you paid that on twice your income. And a lot of this has that feature as well. So some of the differences when you see different macro estimates, people are actually estimating different plans. And what I'm going to try to do is stick to the actual legislation as passed, not omitting the offsets in it and not making additional assumptions about what's legislated in the future, but I'll come back to that. So looking at some of the estimates out there, these are five of the ones I'm aware of that modeled the entire legislation. They found 
growth rate effects of between 0 and 0 0.2 over the next decade with that clustered much closer to 0, well lower than one-tenth of 1 percent. Um, and I should be clear, by the way, I'm talking about the next decade today. I'm not talking about any um, Keynesian effects in 2018, which I think could be substantially larger than the long-run um, effects that I'm talking about here. Even the Tax Foundation, which is tends to be more optimistic about the impact of tax changes on the economy than many organizations had a long run output level of 1.7 and doesn't really have a model of transition to that steady state. There's then a set of models which modeled a 20% corporate rate. Um, Aponamathur and, and Cody Callan at AEI did that. Um, Barrow together with Hubbard, Holtzikin, Taylor, a whole bunch of others had something in the Wall Street Journal where they said 3% in the long run, Marty had um, uh, two tenths of a percent per year, and CEA, as Kevin said, had three to five percent, although I think the five percent was with permanent expensing, and the three was more the result of the rates um, itself. A lot of those numbers can, are. Can I give a point of information, sure. which is the 1.7 for the tax foundation assumes the expiration of the expensing? And, and so Correct. you have to, like, so you have to make it just as a point of information. So you have to form, right now, firms have to decide whether they think expensing is really going to expire in the fifth year. And if they thought it was permanent, then the tax foundation estimate was about the same as ours, right? And when we analyzed it, we analyzed permanent expensing. Yeah, just so to be very clear. It was just a point of information. No, I, I appreciate that. And I tried to be very clear about that. Everything here that says TCGA is analyzing the legislation that was passed. That's also what I'm going to be doing. There then is the possibility of future tax legislation, and future tax legislation could raise growth or lower growth and has all sorts of opportunities. So one could also model future tax legislation. That's not, um, that's not uh, what I'm doing here. So um, by the way, then there's just this question of a lot of this is about the long run level. How would you translate a long run level into a 10 year growth rate? Um, Robert Barrow and something recently proposed a 5% convergence rate. That's faster than what's generally found in the literature. It had some reasons for why it would happen here. There, if you had a 3% long run level, that would be one tenth of 1% over the next decade. There's an OECD paper that um, a lot of economists had relied on that gets you about a tenth on the growth rate. Treasury in the past using theirs you would turn into about two tenths. Um, but just so when you hear 3% in your head, I think you want to hear a growth rate of about one-tenth of 1% 1 per year over the next decade based on a variety of ways of doing it um, when you have that long run level. So now, um, why are the effects not as large as you think? Um, the first um, is that corporate capital is actually a smaller portion of the economy than most of us have in its head. Second, that most of the analysis we've seen takes all of the offsets in the plan and models them as if they're lump sum taxes. And they're really not lump sum taxes, and I'll go into that in some detail. And then the third is crowd out. Um, and there's a lot of different types of crowd out. The first is non-corporate and residential capital shifting to the corporate sector. Now, that might help if we have a trillion dollars, you know, if we have a billion dollars less in housing and a billion dollars more invested in corporate capital. But that's a second order issue. You can't just take the billion dollars in extra corporate capital and ignore the reduction elsewhere. Um, you have foreign financed investment, which means you can see things that increase GDP, but don't increase GNP or national income. Um, with a higher capital stock, you get higher depreciation. This is why in the past, a lot of dynamic analyses have focused more on national income than GDP, so you don't get confused by that. And then finally, um, the issue of increased domestic borrowing, reducing investment. And some of the things Kevin showed were for the corporate side, the, um, as I think he even acknowledged, a lot of this was on the individual side. A lot of the extra debt will be associated with that. And so I'll talk about some modest crowd out from that as well. Um, the, just as a side note, by the way, um, nothing we're looking at is welfare. Um, it's not even national income. And if you want to do welfare, you'd want to take into account, uh, oops, that should be reduced leisure, um, and uh, subtract the cost of reduced leisure and reduced consumption. This is really important because if you're trying to ask, somebody gets a $200 tax increase and gets $200 of higher wages, you know, where did those wages come from? Did they get paid more per hour or did they work harder to get that money? The evaluation of how to compare distributional tables and what you get out of this 
matters a lot with welfare. And when you do it, plausible welfare effects are about a quarter of the GDP growth effects. Um, in most of these models over the next decade, for example, you see consumption falling, um, not rising. So yes, people will get a raise. Uh, people will also not be spending that raise. They'll be saving it to help us be the big glorious country we'll be in the future as a result of this. Um, in terms of corporate capital, we all have in our head that the capital to output ratio is something like three to one. Um, that's true for fixed assets in 2016, we're 57 trillion. A bunch of them were government assets, a bunch of them were private residential, a bunch of them were pass-through. Corporate fixed assets were 12 trillion. Um, and that's important because you need about an 18% increase in corporate capital to get a 3% increase in the level of GDP. So you need to, a really, really large increase in this segment of the economy. And that's an 18% increase, by the way, with no change in the others. If that 18% is to some degree because you're taking capital out of private residential and moving it into corporate, you need something even more than that. Uh, the crux, though, of what I'm going to go through is that many of the corporate rate, this is looking at 2027, which is something approximating a steady state. There's a lot of timing shifts in this bill that make it hard to evaluate in any given year. 2027, sort of away from a lot of those. So if you want to do the type of comparative statics exercise I'm going to take you through, um, that's a good year to, to choose for it. So many of the corporate rate estimates modeled just that 20% reduction. There also in that year was $67 billion raised from eliminating the manufacturing deduction. Just to understand what that is, that is a, you only pay, um, if, you're man, if you're engaged in domestic production, taxes on 91% of your income, which means you're paying at an effective tax rate of a little bit over 31.5%. Now, I think it makes sense to get rid of that deduction. I think we'll get a better composition of capital. I'll come back to that. But getting rid of that deduction is a marginal rate increase. Um, the bill, after four years, um, ends the expensing of R&D and would require businesses to amortize it over five years, something I think has not gotten enough attention um, in discussions. Limiting interest deductions affects marginal rates. Um, limiting net operating losses affects the incentive to undertake risk. All of these things should be factored into an analysis as well. And then there's another 39 billion of miscellaneous stuff. So as, corp as Kevin said, the corporate plan actually is smaller than a lot of people have in their head. It's more like two or three tenths of a percent of GDP um, and something much larger than that. And that's where a lot of this growth um, comes from. Just to look at marginal rates, um, this is the overall effective marginal rate on corporate capital. This is calculations that I did um, using a spreadsheet that Apana Arthur and Cody Callen developed at AEI. It's part of their open source project that Kevin was very big in championing. And um, you know, it uses pretty much very straightforward um, effective marginal tax rates. So the effective marginal tax rate goes down a little bit, and then it starts to march up. And in steady state, it's actually considerably higher than where it is today. If you compare this to the baseline, the baseline also would have gone up because 50% expensing was set to expire. So we could have kept that 10 forever by making 50% bonus permanent. If we had just followed the law, it also would have risen, although not quite as much as it does under this. So this is the first really striking thing, is that marginal tax rates are actually up under this legislation. And to take you through why that's the case, I'll look at three of the four components of investment that went into this. Um, the first is equipment. So equipment right now has a 35, last year had a 35% rate and 50% bonus depreciation. For the first five <coughs> years, the 21% rate plus expensing lowers that marginal rate a lot. But then after 2023, the expensing isn't just goes away, it's actually phased out, and it was phased out with the intention that it truly um, went away. That was Senator Flake's intention in doing that. And so by the last year, it turns out that a 21% rate plus normal depreciation is actually a higher marginal tax rate than a 35% rate plus bonus. So if all we cared about were marginal rates, we could have just made bonus permanent and have done a lot more for that than um, what this legislation did. And that applies to about $800 billion 
in annual investment. Um, just to see in the baseline, um, equipment investment is lower than the baseline. So when you're doing growth, invest, growth estimates, we are cutting marginal rates relative to what would have happened if bonus went away. Uh, let's look at structures. They're a lot simpler because things aren't really changing around there. And a lot of the economics in this, as uh, many economists have stressed, is really on the structure side, that this is going to cause a lot more investment in structures where the marginal rate does um, come down quite a lot. The r and &E is something that people haven't looked at very much at all. Right now, the marginal rate is about minus 40 when you take into account the r and &E credit. That's where it would stay absent legislation. And as of 2018, that marginal rate is substantially higher. Um, the reason is that when you have expensing, if you start to limit the deductibility of interest, that actually raises your effective marginal tax rate because interest deductions are no longer as valuable to companies. You're effectively paying zero tax because you're expensing, and now your interest deductions aren't as valuable. Starting in 2022, you can no longer expense your R&D. You have to amortize it over five years, and that brings the tax rate on it to um, about zero, and that applies to $200 billion of annual investment. So it's these three plus IP that's not R&D that were averaged together to create that um, first chart. Um, Kevin was right to stress it's not just about um, marginal rates. Average rates matter, too, and they matter for large, lumpy location decisions. Um, it's worth highlighting for a moment that a lot of this tax debate was conducted with people using models that assumed the United States was a small, open economy. Um, that's what the tax foundation modeling is. If we truly are a small, open economy, then actually that effective average tax rate effect doesn't matter anymore because we're just going to get all the capital that we can possibly and profitably use given our marginal tax rate. So this is already um, sort of shifting around the assumptions a little bit. And, I, I, and I, I don't think a small open economy is a reasonable assumption. So I don't, I don't personally um, mind that shift. The second thing I'd say about these average tax rate effects is in some sense, and it's not like I can do this any better than anyone else, you don't want to model what's the impact of lowering the US corporate rate ceteris paribus. You want to impact what's the impact of lowering the US corporate rate, taking into account the behavior that's going to induce on the part of everyone else. And part of what we're doing here is instituting a race to the bottom. And so some of the economic benefits from lower relative rates that we think we're going to get, we're not going to ultimately uh, materialize. So if you look at average tax rates, average tax rates are down by an average of about two percentage points. This is just using the um, JCT score, looking at corporate revenue before, corporate revenue after, divided by um, corporate profits, which are assumed fixed in this. And the reason why the average rate is down by a lot less than one might think is that this also includes the manufacturing deduction, the NOLs, the R&E amortization, the interest limitations, all of those other things um, as well, which one would want to take into account in thinking about these average tax rates. So let's now, oh, and then because this is a finance panel, I thought somebody should say something about debt and equity. Um, one of the interesting things in this bill is that right now, as we all know, debt financed uh, investment is heavily tax favored. This would actually reverse that and give the tax favoritism to um, equity financed investment. I think the ideal would be that those numbers um, were about the same and the tax system was neutral towards debt and equity. I think maybe I'd prefer, I prefer this direction of, of bias to the other, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it also, as you can see, reduces the differential between tax rates on equipment structures and R&E that we have in the law today. So it becomes much more neutral towards those different types of investment. Um, so let's bring this all together. If you take just the marginal rate reduction, oops, sorry, all, all the marginal rate reductions from the statutory rate reduction, but you ignore all the offsets, you get an increase in the long run output level of 0.6. That's using a user cost elasticity of um, minus one. You add in these average tax rate effects using the Devereux and Griffith elasticity 
of minus three, and that actually is where the bulk of your growth effects are coming from. And the combination of these says that the rate reduction alone is raising the long run level of output by 1.6. Um, this is the same number that AEI published um, with uh, Panamatha and Cody Callen. They had 1.7, but they were modeling a 20% um, corporate rate. This is a 21% corporate rate. So this is pretty similar to a lot of the modeling out there, gets numbers like this. Let's now model the offsets. The first is the repeal of the domestic production deduction. That takes away 9% of the growth. Um, and there's an appendix that I'll post that explains this. The r &E amortization takes away 22%. The um, adjustment for the limitation on interest deduction takes away 21% of it. The other raisers, um, I just sort of assumed they were half lump sum, half marginal. Probably not a great assumption, but I don't know what a great one is. There's a lot of interactions between all of those. Oh, oh sorry. And then deficit crowd out. Um, I assume three basis points for every percentage point higher on the debt, um, that crowds out about another 20%. Taking into account the interactions of all of this, you get all the corporate provisions raising the long run output level by about three tenths of a percent, raising the annual growth rate over the next decade by about 0, 0.0. And by the way, all of this is coming from the average tax rate effects. If you look just at the marginal tax rate effects for the plan as a whole, um, they would be negative. This estimate seems really small, but it's actually very consistent with what um, the uh, Joint Committee on Taxation did. It's very consistent with the Penn-Wharton model. It's very consistent with the Tax Policy Center. And what all of these institutions have in common is that they're modeling the full plan, not just um, parts of the plan. And when you model the full plan, you get a really big adjustment um, to those parts. Now, what is this um, missing? Um, first of all, this is missing improvements in the composition of investment, which I think could result in larger output effects and I think are quite important. So we're gonna get less investment in manufacturing, more investment in utilities, transportation, and wholesale trade. Um, that will help the economy. Um, we'll get a shift from residential to corporate, a shift from debt to equity. And I think that composition of capital is a second order thing, but is on the positive side. On the other hand, higher rates on R&D could result in lower output and growth effects. Um, but then the last thing is that future tax legislation will matter a lot. You know, there were a lot of extenders that weren't in this bill. What will happen to them? Will the delayed offsets like ending R&D expensing actually happen? What will happen to equipment expensing after 2022? Will the large swaths of the bill on the individual side be made permanent after 2025? And then finally, how will the political and deficit outlook? So you will get very different numbers if you make different assumptions about all of this. I actually don't know how to predict any of this. Um, and part of why I don't know how to predict any of this is that on the one hand, I think everything will be extended and all of the offsets will delayed offsets will never go into effect. On the other hand, um, there's this. The blue bars are what the deficits are without um, anything being made permanent. They get to 5% of GDP, that's a trillion dollars, very, very quickly. The light bars are if you extend everything or cancel or delay the offsets, you get to 7% of GDP. And so my political economy models of how you deal with tax extenders, how you deal with these things sort of fail in the face of five, six, seven percent of GDP deficits, because I think the politics there will be um, quite different. I want to end up, um, conclude with saying tax reform is needed now more than ever. Uh, the main purpose of the tax system is to raise revenue at 17 percent of GDP. Um, we're way below the 21 percent that Bill Simpson wanted. Progressivity is obviously all of our social welfare functions differ. I, probably people could guess mine. Um, efficiency, I think it's a real concern, what's happening to marginal tax rates under this legislation. Um, simplification, I think um, uh, uh, more, uh, sorry, more standard deduction um, will increase simplicity, um, but the substantial new complexity on the pass-through side, which we haven't talked about at all, and then the tax code, the, in, the amount of instability in the tax code on the business side and the individual side right now is really quite phenomenal. Um, what I would do, and we can talk about this more, is more revenue. I think we should be shifting our tax system to get less 
more from individuals at high incomes and less at the entity level. On the corporate side, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with a higher corporate rate. I think there's room to toughen up the international provisions. And I think as part of this, if you make expensing permanent, you can actually get more revenue, have more stability in the tax code, and have lower marginal tax rates than we have right now. Um, would love to think about you know, instruments like VATs, um, business activity taxes, or carbon taxes, but actually the current tax structure we have you know, does work and is functional at rates a couple points higher, and a couple points higher would, would raise a lot more revenue. So I don't see anything wrong with that either. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Okay, Alan. Okay. So, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, it's uh, great and also challenging to go after Kevin and um, Jason. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to take a somewhat different uh, uh, tack and uh, think uh, more about tax reform in the context of the changing economy. Um, and in a sense, talk about, I mean, J Jason just said that tax reform is needed more, more than now, more than ever. And, and I think it's certainly, given the temporary provisions uh, in the current law, we're obviously going to be revisiting tax reform uh, in, the in the not too distant future. Um, but to motivate uh, the themes I'm going to talk about, I just want to use two figures. Uh, the first is uh, what's been happening to corporate tax rates. And this is for the G7. If you look at the OECD, it looks similar. And indeed, these are from OECD data. Uh, I think Jason said we were starting, initiating a race to the bottom. I, I would characterize it more that we're joining a race to the bottom. <laughs> well, I've said accelerating race okay. to the bottom, absolutely. Um, the, the, um, uh, th this is, of course, only through 2017, so it doesn't include the U.S. legislation. Um, but obviously, there have been uh, sharply declining uh, corporate tax rates. Now, uh, that's pretty well known, and it's certainly true that the United States had become an outlier uh, prior to the tax cut. Uh, what I think people have focused less on is other changes. Uh, and so here is, uh, over a somewhat different period, but from the same data source from the OECD, the uh, evaluated tax rates uh, for uh, the G7. Now, of course, it's actually for the G6, because the U.S. doesn't have evaluated tax. Um, so the U.S. is actually in this figure, but it's at zero. Um, but you can see, uh, again, a, a trend, except this time the trend is upward, uh, with to, during this period, two countries, Canada and Japan, initiating value-added taxes, and the other countries generally increasing their rates of value-added tax. Um, and that, I think, uh, is an, uh, th there's a reason for this. It's, it's not just uh, accidental, I think, having to do with the changing economies, uh, nature of, of the economies. And it also says something about where the U.S. is likely going to end up, and, it, and it, I think it does um, pick up from the uh, comments Jason made at the end about the, not only the temporary provisions that have to be addressed, but the deficits uh, that we will be facing in the coming years. Okay, so uh, now let me, uh, having given you my uh, uh, pictures, uh, let, me, let me just uh, make a variety of points. First, uh, what do I see as the key facts of, uh, of the changing economic environment that uh, have been compelling these uh, changes in corporate and consumption taxes, uh, and what does that say about uh, the uh, suitability of the tax measure we just passed and, and uh, what unfinished business we have? First of all, um, it, uh, and Jason mentioned briefly that the, the, the complexity of pass-through provisions, uh, on the order of a half of uh, U.S. business income is generated outside the corporate sector, perhaps a little more than half, depending on the year. Uh, and so if we tend to think of our model, in our models of modeling business behavior as corporate behavior, well, that's appropriate for some things. So if we're thinking about multinational companies, we're thinking about large corporations. Uh, 
But if we're thinking about the business sector in the U.S., then that's not, not an accurate uh, characterization. Uh, second, um, the uh, share of, uh, for the corporate sector, that is for that declining share of income accounted for by the corporate sector, it's become much more international. So for example, over the last uh, 50 years, the share of income of U.S. resident companies coming from overseas operations has increased by a factor of five, from something like 6% to nearly a third. The uh, share of assets that businesses have that are uh, accounted for by intangible capital, according to different sources, has roughly doubled over the same period. Um, and uh, again, thinking about the international aspect, the, uh, sh the share of ownership of U.S. corporations of, uh, by foreigners has been going up by one recent estimate by uh, Rosenthal and Austin at the uh, Tax Policy Center. A quarter of U.S. corporate equity is now held by foreign shareholders. So you have a, a, some pretty important changes in the nature of ownership uh, and uh, the nature of assets. Uh, and finally, on top of all this, one should add that we have this big fiscal gap, uh, and uh, we also have issues of uh, pretty significant issues of inequality. So what are the implications of, of, of these changes? That is, stepping away from what we actually just did, what would that lead one to, to think about? Well, first of all, it suggests that the, uh, our, our traditional method of taxing business income, particularly corporate income, based on some combination of where the income is earned that is based on the source of income, and where the companies have residence, uh, that is the, the actual, whether it's a U.S., so-called U.S. company, um, are uh, getting uh, less appropriate. Um, to be a U.S. resident company uh, anymore, uh, now that companies have operations, even if it's a U.S. company, have operations around the world, um, it's a lot easier for them to change their residence, and indeed this is what led to the uh, large number of corporate inversions that we've been observing in recent years. Uh, it's a lot easier if you already have operations around the globe to uh, either to merge with another company or to change the location of your, of your parent company. Uh, as to uh, uh, the, the attempts to tax businesses based on where the income is earned, again, if you're earning income around the world, it's a lot easier to shift the location of where you report your income. And that's especially true if that income is generated by intangible capital. Because it's a lot easier to say, well, I see a factory in Pittsburgh. Uh, there's got to be a rate of return attached to that uh, than by trying to figure out where intellectual property is in some physical sense and then associate a rate of return with that. And so this has led to an enormous amount of profit shifting by multinationals. Um, and. Uh, associated with trying to tax based on where their income is earned. Uh, for non-corporate businesses, uh, which are, as I said, are becoming more important, um, you have the difficulty, particularly where you have uh, uh, owners who are actively involved in the company, of distinguishing between capital income and labor income. Uh, and so, whereas that might not be such a big issue for a multinational corporation, for a lot of pass-through businesses, which, as I said, are becoming more important, this is an issue. Um, and then finally, just as a, a sort of a research uh, question or in terms of how, do, how one analyzes the effects of tax policy, and again, getting, this is more on the corporate side, thinking about companies with international um, activities, relying more heavily on intellectual property, it makes the measure of, how, of incentives uh, imposed by the tax system more complicated. Uh, and this came up in both Kevin's and, and Jason's presentations. So traditionally, and I, and I think of traditionally as being sort of what I learned and what I did early in my career, we, we sort of looked at uh, marginal effective tax rates. So taking account of interest deductibility, accelerated depreciation, corporate rates, maybe individual rates, 
you know, sort of what is the uh, overall tax wedge imposed on marginal investment decisions. I think that's gotten a lot more complicated, uh, not only because we sort of understand now that the decisions are more, are, are more sophisticated, but because of the nature of, of the investments and the, and the corporations. Investing in intellectual property means you've got to think about things like the R&E credit, the tax treatment of R&D. Having multinational operations means you have to think uh, about discrete location decisions, not just about marginal decisions uh, where you already have operations in a particular country. And importantly, you need to think about things like profit shifting. So uh, we tend to think of profit shifting as sort of a, that's a pejorative term, and we tend to think of that as bad. On the other hand, to the extent that companies in the U.S. Uh, are engaging in profit shifting and in so doing are reducing the effective tax rate on their U.S. operations, because they're reporting half the income in the Republic of Ireland, uh, that may actually, tightening those provisions, uh, may actually raise the effective tax rates of the companies on their U.S. activity. That's not necessarily uh, the way you want to reduce tax rates, Although, you know, one could even spin an argument where it would be if you think that multinationals are more elastic in their responses than other companies. So just in ge as a, a general proposition, one wants to think carefully about the comprehensive effects of taxes uh, on, on incentives to invest. So now I'm going to come uh, back to the, uh, the second of my slides. How, how should one deal with uh, the first, actually, the both slides, how should one deal with these issues? Well, I think uh, as countries have been doing, lowering your corporate tax rates, which effectively is moving away from both source and residence-based taxation. A lot of countries have been moving toward territorial tax system, which is what the U.S. is doing here. Uh, but you're moving away from relying on taxing profits based on source and residence but simply by reducing the corporate tax rate because you're not putting as big a tax wedge uh, uh, affecting decisions with respect to where a company resides or where it reports its income. Uh, because of the importance of individual uh, pass-through businesses, uh, I think there's a, more of a compulsion or, or, or a push to try, uh, trying to stop distinguishing between capital and labor income. Um, and finally, to get to my, uh, my, my last uh, of the facts that I presented, given that we have deficits, uh, given that we have inequality, try to uh, deal with these problems in a way uh, that doesn't increase deficits and isn't regressive. Now, uh, a move toward some sort of progressive consumption taxation uh, accomplishes all of these objectives. Uh, if it's progressive, it it's doesn't have to be uh, worse than the distribution of income. Uh, it raises revenue, doesn't distinguish between capital and labor income, and shifts the locus of taxation from where companies report their residents and from uh, where they report the location of their income to where their customers are, uh, because that's what destination-based consumption taxes do. Um, now, that could be through a, a, um, a destination-based cash flow tax. It could also be through a VAT uh, with uh, further adjustments to make the provisions uh, uh, less regressive. For example, com combining of that with reductions in employment taxes, which, by the way, have also been happening in some of the countries that have been increasing their VATs. So I think that is ultimately where we're going. And in some sense, we've done the first part of it. That is, we've lowered the corporate tax rate. Um, and the rest of it's yet to come. So uh, to do a postmortem on the, on the tax bill as it's passed, um, I, I think one could, could summarize it by saying there's good news and bad news. I think uh, moving away from source and residence-based taxation through a reduction in the corporate tax rate makes sense. Uh, and it, it's obviously made sense to all the other countries uh, in the G7 uh, well before us. Uh, and, and in addition, something we haven't focused on uh, is there a lot of, I think, r relatively sensible provisions having to do with international, the treatment of international income? Um, Kevin mentioned the acronyms guilty and beat. I won't, I won't b bore you with what those things stand for, but there's basically a few provisions, one of which is a, uh, Im imposes immediate taxation at a rate of 10% over a threshold rate of return on offshore income, which 
has the effect of, of taxing uh, income reported in low-tax countries uh, at, at some rate, and that is something that uh, existed in the Obama administration proposals, a, a form of it. Um, there's another provision that uh, imposes a minimum tax, uh, ignoring related party transactions for companies operating in the U.S. Uh, that has the effect of uh, doing what a border adjustment would have done, which is to take out the ability of, take away the ability of companies to use profit shifting, at least on the import side. Uh, and, and these provisions, and moving to a territorial system, also take away the so-called lockout effect that existed in the uh, current or previous tax system, which was one that discouraged companies from, uh, re from repatriating profits to the U.S., because there is now, going forward, no uh, tax disincentive to doing that. So I think that's the good news. Uh, and I also think that the combination of uh, expensing and lower corporate tax rate, even with some of the other uh, mitigating factors, is, is a, a, a moving us uh, in a positive direction in terms of investment incentives. So the bad news, uh, and there's a lot, I think there's a, uh, some good news and also a lot of bad news. I think the, the pass-through, the, we haven't talked about the, the new regime for pass-through businesses, but again, you know, this is like half of business income. Pass-through businesses are co now a subject to a favorable tax regime relative to ordinary wage and salary income, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on uh, enforcement. Uh, there was a term used to describe the legislation, particularly in this context that I hadn't seen before, reference to so-called guardrails that were being implemented uh, to protect the tax base in this area. It strikes me that t designing a tax system that needs guardrails is not a good idea, uh, that you've got something fundamentally wrong with what you're doing if you need to put in all, all kinds of anti-avoidance provisions. Um, there's some, you, you, at, at its base, it's not a logical tax system. There is no shift to destination-based taxation, uh, and uh, that has the effect. I mean, I, I, you know, it, you can't say where do the deficits come from because they, you could you could think of all kinds of pieces of the uh, parts of the legislation that increase the deficit and other parts that reduce it. Uh, but it's certainly true that had there been a border adjustment, had there been introduction of a VAT, uh, there would have been substantially more revenue raised, and the revenue loss. I, obviously, if all the provisions are made permanent, is bigger than the revenue loss actually reported uh, in the uh, legislative score. Uh, and that is not good news. We started, uh, before the legislation was passed, with a challenging uh, long-run fiscal uh, picture uh, with a pretty big fiscal gap. Um, Bill Gale and I are currently doing our annual update, and uh, we sometimes view this as sort of a chore if not much happens because uh, we just sort of do the budget analysis and we have to think of a new title for our paper and, and sort of update the numbers and it's, they're sort of like they were the year before. This year we're actually approaching the task with some excitement uh, because uh, things are really going to change this year and I think it, there will also be, uh, I think, a lot of information we can provide when taking into account uh, the possible future path of tax policy taking account of temporary provisions. There are provisions here affecting businesses, and, and uh, uh, Jason mentioned them, that not only uh, mitigate the beneficial effects of reductions in the cost of capital, but also make no sense. Uh, one of them is the requirement for R&D capitalization after five years. Uh, and I don't know where it came from, and I don't know what it was motivating it. Um, then the other is the tightening of the treatment for net operating losses. Um, there seem, this is one place where I think if you say, well, what do, what, uh, how, do you, uh, how can you confirm uh, whether economists have any impact? Uh, this is one of these things where um, I think economists would generally agree that it's stupid to uh, discourage uh, uh, investments in risky rather than safe assets by putting all kinds of restrictions on ability to uh, get uh, some sort of loss offsets for, uh, uh, for uh, losses. Um, and there's a tightening of net, net operating loss deductions for uh, carry forwards, elimination of tax loss carry backs. Um, there's real money in that, which is why it was there. Um, but obviously, someone uh, thought it was a good idea and it, or innocuous, and, it, and it, I think it clearly isn't. Um, and then I guess the final a bit piece of bad news, uh, to which I've already alluded, is 
that we need to revisit. I mean, and I, maybe you could view this as good news. That is, there are things we didn't do that we should have done, um, and we are going to have to revisit the legislation because of all the expiring provisions. And uh, one would hope um, uh, that, uh, 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 that when we do that, we won't simply say, well, let's just extend all this stuff, but we would actually think more deeply about, um, uh, about what's going to happen. Um, let me just uh, end with one comment. Uh, that has to do with uh, measuring GDP effects. It, this is something that's been recognized but it, by many people. I know I've talked to Kevin about it, but it somehow isn't incorporated in most forecasts of uh, growth uh, increases in growth. I certainly don't think it's included in any of the studies that uh, Jason mentioned. Uh, and it's, uh, it's important to understand it so as not to be confused by it. One of the important effects of this legislation, I think, will be to reduce incentives for U.S. multinationals or multinationals operating in the U.S., whether they, they be foreign or U.S., to engage in transfer pricing manipulation. Transfer pricing manipulation is basically overstating the value of related party imports in the U.S. or understating the value of related party exports from the U.S. so, that, so as to shift profits from the U.S. to some lower tax jurisdiction whether it be Ireland or Luxembourg or, or some uh, Caribbean nation. Uh, and we know that U.S. Multina that multinationals report a lot of their profits, an inordinate share of their profits, in such low-tax uh, countries. And it, it's certainly true that both the carrot and the stick in this legislation, the lower tax rate being the carrot uh, and, the, and the stick being the uh, the tax on offshore income, immediate tax on offshore income at a, ten, at a I think, 10.5 percent rate um, initially um, over a, a 10 percent rate of return, are going to uh, discourage companies from reporting profits in these countries. Now, to the extent that a lot of this is going on, and estimates of how much of it is going on vary, uh, at least one suggests that it's on the order of, you know, half of the reported trade deficit, which is about 3% of GDP, so that's like 1.5% of GDP. If you, if you think that, that uh, a significant part of that is going to disappear, so that the U.S. multinationals are now reporting higher profits in the U.S. and lower profits in Ireland or other countries, that could lead to a pretty big increase in reported GDP, because that shows up, that decline in, import, in net imports shows up as a mechanically as an increase in GDP. Now, on the one hand, we shouldn't congratulate ourselves too much about it because it has no real effects. Um, it may have revenue, tax revenue effects, but it doesn't have any real effects. It's not going to increase wages. Uh, it's not going to do anything like that. It will increase, it would increase measured productivity because it's going to make GDP higher. Um, but we should take that into account when thinking about Policies. For example, the Fed uh, has raised its forecast for GDP growth in 2018 uh, by a few tenths of a percent, and I think it attributed some of that to the, the next year, attributed some of that to the tax bill. My guess is that doesn't incorporate this change, um, but to the extent that actual measured GDP changes drive monetary policy decisions or other government decisions, I think it's important for us to understand uh, what's going on. Um, we certainly will be in a position to look at various indicators, uh, over time anyway, to, to see what the source of any improvements in the trade balance or increases in GDP are attributable to. But this is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, forecast growth. The, whatever, I, I suspect, I don't think your, your uh, uh, consensus of different uh, estimates had any of this in it. I think the DSGE model, which is part of the JCT, does, and their other two models don't, and none of the others do. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's just a, just an observation uh, that when we think about uh, the success or failure of this and look at uh, reported GDP, uh, we should uh, think about where that's coming from. And uh, no, that is a success. That is one of the aims of the legislation is to reduce transfer pricing manipulation. So we shouldn't ignore the fact that if it happens. On the other hand, we shouldn't confuse it with uh, real ch changes in real economic activity.
Okay, thank you very much, Alan. So now I'd like to offer uh, the panelists an opportunity to uh, respond and react to uh, to what they heard. So let's just go take it in order of uh, the okay, presentations. Sure. Well, so. Yeah, okay. thanks, Josh, and thanks, Jason and Alan. The uh, uh, first thing was an opportunity, which I am grateful to Jason for, to uh, shout out uh, where I was before I came to the CEA. Um, the Open Source Policy Center. I was actually gratified to see that Jason was using, uh, you know, my own software to disagree with me. Uh, I think that there's too little of that in, in, in this profession, and uh, I was really uh, uh, extremely focused in the five or six <coughs> years before I came uh, into CEA on building the Open Source Policy Center at AEI, where if you want to have your own thoughts about user costs, if you want to have your own thoughts about you know, how, what happens if I have an individual tax reform? What would the joint tax score look like? That there's a web-based interface where everybody can play with it and see what they think. Uh, and, and I think that that really helps, as we saw uh, with Jason's presentation, helps uh, us understand uh, where our disagreements are when they, when they exist. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's OSPC.org, it's not a for-profit. So I think as a public official, I could just say, I, I use it a lot uh, still when I'm trying to think about things. I think that uh, Alan's uh, concluding remarks really get to the nub, uh, there, there are really two points, I think, of continuing uh, disagreement with me and Jason, but it gets to the nub of it, which again, uh, think about that the world we had, remember the slide where I said, okay, do I want to put my 100,000 in Ireland or do I want to put it here? Uh, so, so that the world that we live in is one where uh, a U.S. multinational will face a decision like that. But then what they'll do is they'll, they'll locate the activity in Ireland, uh, thus reducing the demand for labor here and increasing the demand for labor in Ireland uh, and driving wages up there and driving wages down here. Uh, and uh, if you look at U.S. Uh, foreign sub uh, profitability, it tends to be in the sort of 50, 60% a year range. So there's a literature on this that goes back to the 80s with Puerto Rico back in the day, you might recall. Uh, and and so, so it's a really big deal. And then when the rents end up offshore, uh, there's a big literature uh, in the labor literature on the location of rents and, and how wages are uh, responsive to that. Uh, and the basic idea is that the sort of observation which you know is true, but it's, a, it's in the literature too. It goes back to some stuff Larry Katz was doing when I was in grad school that, that uh, it, you know, the janitors at Google make more money than the janitors at some not so profitable machine shop. Uh, and uh, so that there's been quite a, a, a lot of uh, innovation recently in the literature on when the rents are all somewhere else, how does that help their workers? What would happen if the rents came back here? Would the workers bear some of it? And I find, uh, you know, and I talked about this at my uh, talk at the Tax Policy Center a few months ago, uh, I find it pretty convincing that, that when the activity comes back here uh, at the margin, then that, that's going to benefit U.S. workers in the near term because of the clear link between rents and, and wages. But in the long term, too, because the next time they decide to locate a factory someplace, uh, then they're going to locate it here instead of there. Uh, we were talking about guilty and beat, uh, and it's something I, I just have to say that, that, that it's pretty simple to understand one of the most important things we haven't talked about in the tax bill, but it helps you understand how I think this bill really moves us ahead of the curve in a big way uh, on, on this problem. Uh, and, and so basically what you do is if you're a U.S. multinational now, you add up all your tangible uh, property all around the world, multiply that by 0.1, that's your deemed tangible income. If your income outside the U.S. is above that, we tax it. It's that simple. It's a little more complicated than that, but, but that's the way to think about it. And so I think that this bill, in addition to, you know, Alan mentioned carrot and stick, that, that it really does have a great deal of promise of taking this problem where all this stuff's happening over there. That's why we had capital deepening go negative for the first time. It, you know, it can come back here. Uh, that I think we could be reasonably optimistic about it. And then the second thing I, I thought, which Jason was right to emphasize, uh, is that we do need to think carefully about permanent versus transitory. Uh, and this goes back to really the, that paper I mentioned that Alan and I wrote that we presented in the Carnegie Rochester series, that you have this problem that uh, capital spending is forward looking. And so the firms have to ex, you know, form expectations about what the future taxes are going to be. And these expectations can be really, really important. Uh, and so if the firms right now look at this tax bill and they assume that, that all the corporate stuff is permanent, then their target capital stock is going to be much higher than if they assume the stuff's going to expire in five years. And so what do they expect? 
Um, you know, I, I think that that's the thing that we started wondering about how to model back in the day. And, and the thing that, that, that we used as an identifying assumption in that first paper that, that I wrote my third year of grad school was that because the 86 Act was going to phase stuff in, uh, that we could assume that the firms assumed that those phase-ins would happen, that there wouldn't be another tax bill until the phase-ins had fully happened. And so then we had some variation in future tax rates that we could, we could sort of hardwire in to our model. And again, that helped us find big user costs effects. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I, I think that it's kind of, you know, ironic, though. That, that, so, so, so we live in a, in a difficult uh, political environment. Everybody knows that. Uh, if everything in this bill were permanent, Let's imagine, so we're a bunch of economists and modelers. What would we, what would we write down as the expectation uh, for the firm when it's trying to decide on its target capital stock of tax policy five years from now? What would we write down if everything had been permanent? Uh, how does that compare to what you would write down now? Um, I don't think that the answer is a zero one thing at all. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, that a lot of stuff expired because they had to pass it in reconciliation. They didn't have any Democratic votes. And so, you know, Jason showed you that, that the thing is really quite positive for growth before the stuff expires. And after it expires, uh, it's more questionable. Uh, the stuff would have been permanent if there were a few Democratic votes. And so it's, it's, it's just a little bit odd to sort of say this is a really terrible tax bill. It's not going to have an effect because the stuff expires uh, and, and that the expiration of the stuff is there because the opponents didn't want to vote for it. But if it were permanent, it would be really good. It's just kind of an odd place to be. And, and, and so my final thought on that is that, again, that I think something else that we kind of clearly agree to here is that, that when I read about uh, this stuff sometimes, it seems like, or this tax bill sometimes, it seems like that the opponents of the bill say it's this big tax cut for corporations uh, and, and it's you know, really, you know, give, give away to the rich. It's trickled out economics or whatever. You, you guys see that too. But I think that you can see if we look at the evidence that, that the corporate side has this stuff. Uh, and you have to have an international tax salad. I'm sorry, guardrails, <laughs> like the deemed tangible income. So we got this corporate side where we got the, the rate from the worst on earth to 21 percent at a 10-year cost of $300 billion. Remind you that the GDP in the 10th year is $28 trillion. So for no, at almost no cost, we got a corporate tax reform that got, got us into the middle of the pack competitively uh, internationally. And if you're upset about uh, the costs, the budget costs, then it's because uh, you, you know, the, of the dynamic score, you know, about two thirds of that is the refundable child credit. And I think that there are a lot of equity reasons why you ought to have a refundable child credit. But, but it's a completely different discussion, right, than to say that there's this tax bill that's a giveaway to the rich. Uh, that it's really it's a refundable child credit that accounts for the majority of the after dynamic score, uh, and I think that that's not the way I read about it, uh, but it's the way we talk about it here, and, I, and I'm glad for that. Okay, great, uh, Jason. So um, yeah, thanks thanks again for this um, great discussion, and I didn't have much chance to go into detail on the international side. I actually think the international um, provisions in the bill are generally quite thoughtful, and I say that with a little bit of bias because a number of them um, build on things that we had proposed in the Obama administration. I think a lot of them, and I can't give you any particular proof of this, um, could keep the words the same and change some of the numbers um, in them. The tax rate you have on your excess returns overseas, um, for example, there's some very important details like can you consolidate all your earnings for the test that Kevin described as a global system, or do you have to do it on a per country basis? Um, per country is a little bit more complicated, but it greatly reduces the amount of gaming of using um, you know, German um, income, which is below the threshold target to offset Cayman Islands income. So there's a bunch of stuff like that on the international side that I think could be toughened up, but I do think the structure is right. Um, the structure, as I don't think anyone on this panel would disagree, is really a jury rig thing, though, which is designed to deal with all of the problems Alan said, that we can't measure where income comes from, and we're now trying to patrol it, and we need a lot of different rules to try to patrol it. I think from a tax policy perspective, border adjustment is enormously attractive. It basically says you're going to tax on the basis of something that's not going to shift based on your taxing it, where you're spending money, and you're not going to try to tax the things that can shift easily where you claim your money um, came from. There's a lot of macro issues to work out there, a lot of details to work out, and I hope we use the time between now and the next tax reform to see if we get into a better place um, on that. Um, I then just want to step back and say, you know, part of what makes tax reform difficult 
is the revenue constraints. And I think a lot of the reason that we didn't do it at, with six years of trying in the Obama administration is that we had revenue neutrality as a principle. And with revenue neutrality, you have winners and losers. The problem we're going to face in the next tax reform is to fix all of the different things that Alan and Kevin have talked about will cost 1.5% of GDP. That's how much it costs to make the expensing permanent, to make the other provisions permanent, et cetera. But we need to raise revenue by, I would argue, about 4% of GDP, which means we'd need gross raisers of 5.5% of GDP to make all of this add up. And that's just going to be enormously, enormously um, difficult. And that's why, in some sense, we really just squandered an opportunity. And by the way, every one of the expiring provisions that I talked about had nothing to do with reconciliation or democratic votes. Expensing expires after five years. The, um, all the offsets, like the R&E expensing, start after five years. That wasn't because of any rule in reconciliation. Um, that was because uh, of the revenue target that was chosen. It's all the other expirations in 2025, which were because of the reconciliation, um, which didn't play into it. Um, the last thing I guess I'd say is, um, you know, again, we sort of have to look at things as a whole. So there's a $600 billion child tax credit increase here. There's also a $1.2 trillion raised from eliminating the um, personal exemption. Those are two pretty similar ways at getting at pretty similar groups. The net effect of that is actually progressive and good, and I think there's an argument for getting rid of the personal exemption and replacing it with a child credit. But you don't want to evaluate the impact of this legislation on families with children by looking at one $600 billion provision and ignoring a $1.2 trillion provision um, that's also a part of it. And I think in general, that's been um, you know, a, a little bit of the theme of the analysis. And when you sort of look all in, um, the percentage change in after-tax incomes is higher for people at the top than it is for people in the bottom. Therefore, income inequality by just about any metric will be higher as a result of this. Um, you can say that's good because we were taxing people at the top too much before and that was unfair and we're getting rid of unfair taxation. You can say that's bad because you don't like inequality. I don't think how you can, I don't think anyone could look at this and say that it wouldn't um, result in increases in um, inequality. So um, going forward though, I do think the right way to deal with all of this is another tax reform, but how we're gonna raise taxes uh, reform taxes while raising revenue um, is going to be exceedingly difficult when reforming taxes while keeping revenue neutral was hard enough. Um, and there were even a lot of difficulties um, that the Trump administration had reforming taxes while losing about 1% of GDP. Um, <clears throat> on the subject of guardrails, uh, just a, a, a distinction. So one can characterize the system that we now have as a hybrid uh, of between a residence-based and a source-based corporate tax. The 21% rate on activities in the U.S. is, is a territorial or source-based tax. The 10.5% tax rate over a 10% rate of return threshold on the income of uh, U.S. company operations abroad is a residence-based tax because it only applies to U.S. companies. The it's, it's, it's a uh, reliance on two different approaches, uh, and you could justify it by saying uh, that each one has a problem. Uh, taxing only based on uh, uh, profits earned in the U.S. causes profits and activities to shift out of the U.S., but taxing U.S. companies based on their worldwide income has encourages companies uh, to stop being U.S. companies and be companies that are uh, resident in other countries. So having, a lower having lower tax rates uh, uh, makes all this a lot less of a problem, uh, but we haven't really moved away. We may have improved the tax stream, but we haven't really moved away from our reliance on a combination of source-based and residence-based taxation. So I, I don't view having a residence-based tax rate of 10.5% of as in some sense a, a, a fixing a glitch in the tax system. I think that's just I implementing a part of residence-based taxation. I tend to think of the uh, various provisions that apply to pass-through businesses as of a different character, because they're basically trying to draw lines where there's no real sense 
in drawing lines uh, among activities to try to target something where it's not even it's not even clear what it is uh, the what the objective is in in, uh, in implementing that regime. Whereas I think the international regime, I think one can logically explain what the objective is. I was yeah I was hoping we would we would talk a little bit more about the uh, the the pass through. Uh, issue and in, in in particular, first of all, maybe if, if someone wants to comment on just generally, you know, how should we deal with the fact that in our current business taxation system, uh, there are corporations and there are pass-through entities, and pass-throughs have become an ever-increasing portion, certainly of the vast majority of the number of businesses, and now a majority of the of the business income. Um, how exactly should this ideally be dealt with? Uh, in uh, in the in the construction of our business tax code, anybody want to comment on that? I mean, I have a short answer to that, which is that uh, President Bush formed a tax reform commission that had Jim Paterbo, who I think I saw here before, mm -hmm. and Eddie Lazier on it in 2006, and they proposed that any business with gross revenues, I believe their proposal was 20 million dollars a year, so relatively low threshold, uh, would have to be treated as a C corporation, and you would just treat any medium or large business um, identically. And I think that once you do that, you, you don't need any of these guardrails. You don't need to worry about any non-neutralities in the tax system. You have a lot of issues with dividends and capital gains and two levels of taxes and all of that. But um, I think that's the cleanest, simplest solution. And I think we're probably further away from being able to do it now. It's really hard to give a group something and take it back again. Well, I think we could, we could contrast that with some other proposals that have been made, which is to move completely basically to shareholder level taxation and effective, effectively bring the corporate tax rate to zero and have all income taxed essentially as passed through. Uh, I think that, want to comment on yeah, that? I think that's not feasible. Uh, so I, I was on a couple of uh, uh, panels, commissions uh, uh, many years ago trying to look at uh, reform of the corporate tax. And I think the general consensus was that, particularly if you're thinking about uh, a C corporation with complex ownership, uh, even one, think, or here, put it another way, think about the restrictions on S corporations. S corporations can't have corporate shareholders. They can't have foreign shareholders. They can only have one class of stock. Um, all of those restrictions make it straightforward to treat an S corporation as a pass-through entity and tax all of the income directly to shareholders. Uh, if you had uh, have a C corporation that has two classes of equity, who's, who, who do the retained earnings belong to? If you have a corporation, uh, if, if one of your corporate, if a corporation is, has a corporate shareholder, what do you do about the cascading of, of uh, income between corporations? Um, what do you do about foreigners? Do you give them a pass? Do you, do you try to have a withholding tax? Uh, and I think that so the general consensus was that that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work. Um, you can have some sort of uh, alternatives like a market, you know, mark to market taxation of shareholders or other things like that where you don't have to worry about uh, allocating retained earnings. Uh, I think one of the problems with that is that uh, people view the volatility, uh, uh, you know, uh, volatility of equity as a, at least a political problem, if not an economic problem, in terms of uh, year fluctuations in year-to-year -year individual tax liabilities. Kevin? Can, can, can I, just that uh, this was uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me about uh, the stuff, the negotiations that were going on as we were moving from an outline of a bill to the final bill. Uh, because, you know, as an economist, I would guess that most of the people in this room would say, well, you know, there's different organizational forms. We're in the computer age. If this one is better for me than that one, then I ought to be able to, like, you know, hit return and switch. And that if I were running a business, I would, like, look and see, do I want to be a pass-through? Do I want to be a C-corp? And, you know, me and my accountants would figure it out, and then we'd just flip back and forth depending on what seemed right. Uh, and so, you know, my bias you know, at the beginning of this, just, just as me, Kevin, not as a you know, White House person, was just that, well, you know, if the C-Corp change is a little bigger than the pass-through change, then, you know, why am I worried about that? They'll just switch or something like that. Um, but then, you know, I talked to a lot of people who really cared a lot about it, and I don't want to, you know, quote anybody directly, but the interesting thing is um, that the, the theory 
that the difference matters a lot in the minds of the politicians who really you know, moved the pass through uh, to where it ended up was exactly the theory that you see about this in, uh, in Joseph Schumpeter's writings, actually, in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, uh, that the organizational forms are different. Schumpeter wrote that uh, you know, pass-through-like entities uh, are more, you know, inevitably uh, better for the economy in the long run because they have less of a sort of short run perspective. They tend to be run by you know parents who want to leave it to their kids and stuff like that. You, know, you could read Schumpeter about it, but but the point was is I find the, the confluence of Schumpeter's ideas and not, not that these folks had ever read uh, that. And, and, and I, I came away thinking, geez, when, you know, when I go back to academic life, I really want to study that. Like, are there you know character differences between pass-throughs and C corps that are, that are you know interesting and and econometrically uh, verifiable. So you're, you're less of the school that tax policy should be trying to guide all larger businesses into the C-corporation form. Well, well, I don't know what to think because I don't think that I have enough you know, academic evidence to, to but, but it seems like there's this theory that you know, C-corps ha have too short a horizon and that pass-throughs have a longer horizon, you know, in part because of like Schumpeter-like forces. And I just thought that it was like, so going forward, it's an empirically interesting thing for you know, for us but to Kevin, study. Kevin, is this is this a phenomenon of the organization or of the heavy involvement of an active owner? I mean, it, I mean, would being uh, being taxed as a C corporation uh, reduce the uh, incentives for innovation? It, it, it wouldn't have to be right, but, but but it is an empirical question, right? So 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 it could, so you if that's true, then we shouldn't find anything that these people right. seem to to feel in their hearts right. is out there. I mean, the only thing I'd add is unless you think there's some positive externality associated with it, if pass-throughs are better, then we'll have more of them. The goal of the tax system should be to tax C-corps and pass-throughs on a neutral basis, and then whatever will thrive will thrive. I certainly don't have any prior whatsoever about positive externalities or negative externalities associated with these organizational forms that would be enough for me to say I'd want to strive for a tax system that wasn't anything but neutral. No, that's right. But I, but I think that the Schumpeter uh, hypothesis was that there is such an externality. And, and so anyway, but you could read them yourself. Uh, but they make the uh, money. But anyway, I'll... I, I want to ask one more question before opening it up to the floor, and, and that's about uh, the statistics. Jason, you presented some numbers about um, suggesting that the, uh, the, 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 the Tax Act would uh, move much more towards uh, favoring, uh, well, move away from favoring debt uh, as a form of financing and, 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 and towards equity. And I was wondering if the other panelists might want to comment uh, on, on that and whether, what, what kinds of effects they thought they would have uh, on both the financial and real economy. Well, I think that's right. The interesting thing about it is that with the lower, well, there are a couple of things. First of all, with the lower corporate tax rate, the distortion we would have associated with the difference between debt and equity would have gone down anyway. Mm -hmm. And so uh, introducing the limit, um, uh, in some sense, this is, it, it wouldn't necessarily have expected that to happen uh, in conjunction with a reduction in the corporate tax rate. A second thing that's sort of funny is that uh, you wouldn't necessarily think that the uh, treatment should have been the same for pass-through entities and corporations. Because the owners of, uh, even with the new favorable regime, the owners of pass-through entities' equity uh, is, uh, at the individual level, is taxed you know, m more heavily than dividends and capital gains are. And so you wouldn't necessarily want to have the same, you know, and you have double taxation at the corporate, on the, you have double taxation at the corporate level, you have a single taxation on the individual level. So do, if you were to try, if you were trying to um, sort of equalize, and obviously we, we didn't, as Jason pointed out in his, in his uh, tables. If you were trying to equalize the sort of tax wedge facing returns to equity and returns to debt, uh, you wouldn't have had the same restriction imposed on pass-through entities and corporations. And it was a puzzle to me. I don't know if Kevin has any uh, sort of insight from what, actually, what transpired. It was a puzzle to me that it was done that way. That they didn't say, we, you know, we have a different regime for pass-through entities, and therefore we should have a different uh, limit on interest deductions. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't involved in interest rate, uh, interest deduction conversation. So, so, uh, but what I can say is that that you know, removing the subsidy is probably a good thing, and uh, I think that the um, that the the way that the interest deduction was capped is pretty complicated. 
and um, I think there are going to be a lot of dynamic responses of firms that will but for, probably, for, for, so, but, but I think it will definitely favor equity finance going forward. One of the interesting things, though, is that um, talking, you know, we have to, Jason did this too when he was at CA, you have to keep an eye on markets and stuff, and just one of the things that one of my markets guys told me a couple of weeks ago, and I, I don't know what the data are to support this, but here we are on a public panel, uh, that, mm -hmm. that there seems to be that, like, that, that everybody's out there buying corporate debt because they're worried that issuance is going to go down. And so that, that one of the responses, immediate responses in financial markets was that everybody was calling up their Wall Street firm friends and saying, hey, I want to buy more corporate debt because I'm worried issuance is going to go down. And I guess that that's in part one of the targets of the policy, right? Okay, so we have about a uh, little less than 15 minutes left, uh, and uh, I would like to use that time to open uh, that to the floor for questions. So if anyone has any uh, questions, please uh, come up to the microphones. Okay, uh, over here, on the left. Yeah, yep. sir. Is it uh, okay? Thanks very much for uh, putting together such a distinguished panel um, and for the, the great part. comments as well. Could you identify uh, yourself? Introduce myself. Could, I'm Eric Swick, yes, uh, professor, you. Chicago Booth. Um, my question, I guess, is about uh, the international uh, tax provi or provisions, or in some sense, sort of thinking about because so much of the growth effects um, of the rate reduction not user cost effects on the intended <coughs> margin increasing investment, but seem to come from lower corporate rate here is going to attract activity from overseas to dom domestic inbound investment, and also companies repatriating activity. What's the strongest sort of empirical evidence or research that we have to kind of make that case, or is there, there need for more research on that topic, especially given that there doesn't seem to be still yet neutrality between sort of the effects of investment, you know, the, sort of the after-tax like return on uh, domestic activity and foreign activity even after the reform. So sort of thinking about what evidence are you guys using to think about that? The elasticities, you know, how big do they need to be? Like, and what, where do we get those estimates from? Well, I think the, est I mean, the open source software that Jason was using included an estimate from Devereux and Griffith, which is a sort of a, a standard reference in discrete location decisions. And they were looking at basically responses to average corporate tax rates. Um, I think they were looking within Europe, if I, my recollection. I, the, I think part of the problem is that um, there are all these specific provisions in the new US legislation. Uh, and we talked about the guilty and the beat and so forth. And these uh, affect the incentives for location, uh, as does the corporate rate. And I don't know of any, uh, I, I mean, it would be complicated, as I said before, things like ability to engage in profit shifting, if you have operations in the US, may make you more uh, 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 desirous of having operations in the US. And I, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of paper, I, I can't think of a refereed paper I've seen uh, where people have uh, taken these kinds of things into account. It would be very difficult because, you know, each country has a variety of, of complicated rules, you know, thin capitalization rules, other things like that, that effectively, that affect both the cost of capital in terms of intensive investment decisions, but also the, you know, discrete location decisions. And not only are they different from uh, across different countries, but some of them are pretty complicated and, and even hard to understand uh, in terms of what their effects might be. Okay, I, you want to go too? Oh, sure. I'll, I'll go yeah. I, I think it's a it's a thin literature. I think, you know, based on what we know, I believe in it rather than not believe in it. But I don't believe in it with a high level of confidence. There's like two other papers beyond what what Alan cited. Um, so I think it's a great area um, for more research. And I should say, you know, in the course of the tax debate, I did a certain amount of work with a, a distinguished co-author. And he thought that was complete nonsense. He had never heard of average tax rates mattering, thought only marginal mattered, and thought anyone who said that was, you know, was absurd. And I'm like, well, here's what I wrote in the economic report of the president in 2015. Um, and he's like, well, you're probably absurd too, but I guess we won't, um, in, our, in our joint writing, um, uh, make, make as much of that. So I, I think I'm, I'm much more uncertain, first of all. But second of all, I think that has really important implications for international tax. It says, for example, that switching to a worldwide system 
could have a really positive effect here at a 21% rate because you're raising the tax rate on overseas when you're comparing them for your lumpy location. All of a sudden, the United States is more attractive than overseas. Um, Jim Hines used to always tell me how idiotic I was because the supply of capital is infinitely elastic and it's really dumb to think about that type of decision. That's the wrong way to think about it. Well, it turns out maybe that is a bit the right way to think about it. And so maybe toughening up the international doesn't just get us revenue, but gets us revenue while increasing activity in the United States. Right, which is what I think. But, but just like suppose that you're like old fashioned, uh, not to criticize these guys, but suppose you're old fashioned Hall Jorgensen guy. Then, I mean, if you just parameterize the user cost change, it's about down 15%. It's kind of surprising it's bigger for structures than equipment. It has something to do with the present value depreciation, but if you know that formula. And so, and so if you're an elasticity of one guy, open economy, you can go from there to thinking about what goes on with GDP. There's a second uh, way of doing it, which Devereux and Griffiths uh, you know, pioneered, uh, thinking about average tax rates, which I think is the way to think about the decision to invest in something that's profitable. And a lot of the models that we use to model this tax reform, they're actually no profits. So the whole point of this is that they're moving profits around. And, and and, and the average tax rate is, is, the is the thing that affects the decision to locate like the Apple facility that you can transfer price to. And, and I find that literature really darn convincing. And I find about the best, most advanced, sophisticated paper in that literature to have been written by the guy to the right of me. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, but it's like you're looking at state taxes, state right? Taxes, but, yeah. but could you tell everybody just for a minute about like average tax rates and how they affect the location of plants across states? I, I found that paper really interesting. Well, so well, and, well. But I don't know how to think about how your paper reacts to how I should think about what this tax bill does, too. So it's an opportunity for me to ask you a question. Well, that's, that, 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 I mean, that, that, that is a challenge to map it into the international context. But we, we certainly find that uh, consistent with the uh, theory uh, developed in the Devereux Griffith paper and also with with uh, their uh, results looking within Europe, and we, we find that within the U.S. Uh, companies, when, when states change corporate, corporate taxes, companies tend to respond on the intensive margin uh, more to the marginal, the marginal effective tax rate, and on the extensive margin in terms of where they're going to lo you know, locate an entire operation, uh, it's the average tax rate. So I, I, I think the evidence is uh, uh, you know, is in, is in favor of that theory, uh, both on the, on the uh, you know, domestic side and also uh, 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 inter internationally. Um, of course, you know, the U.S. states have a system of formulary apportionment, and uh, uh, so it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a, an entirely uh, diff different ballgame when we start thinking about uh, the, the system of international taxation that, uh, that the federal government uses. Um, okay, yes. Owens at R from University of Chicago. Hi, Kevin, I had a question about the pass-through uh, comments you had. It was interesting to hear the Schumpeter thing, but can you line that up with the provisions that focused a bit more on passively generated income or, or uh, specific industries? Like, I, I didn't quite see the link between the idea there's a lot of active job creators and the specific provisions and pass-through. So do you have any comments to clarify the thinking behind that? Yeah, the, the pass the pass through stuff was was just it's a historical fact that the pass through stuff was the stuff that was being worked on at the last minute all the way up to the very, very end. It was something that a couple of senators really cared desperately about and um, and the exact rules were not things that came out of the White House. So, so, so I didn't do a pass-through economic analysis and say, here's what the White House insists happen, uh, that, that the pass-through things. And I know the, the rules are complex, and they, they made decisions like they do in legislation sometimes where you wonder, what, what is the story of that one? Um, you know, I'm happy to get back to you with specifics on this, but we're kind of running out of time. But, but, it, but, it, but it's not the case that, you know, we did this CEA report that said this is exactly how you should do pass-throughs, and then they said, well, thank God for you guys. Uh, the pass-through stuff was a work in progress right up to the very end. Okay. Yeah. Over. Uh, Danny Egan, UC Berkeley. Uh, suppose we have a deal on the table in five years. You get permanent expensing. We can loosen the NOL restrictions, and we pay for it with a higher corporate rate. Is that a deal we should take, or would you rather distort domestic investment in order to make gains on the international margin? Do you guys want to? I would take that. You'd take that. Absolutely. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I mean, I can't motivate myself to think too much about it, because I, I think it, just, if you go back to the f first figure, I, I, you know, and that's not a stable situation. They, you know, 
UK has been uh, making noises about, it's already below 20 percent, about lowering it further. France has in process a, a, a series of rate reductions. Uh, so I think in five years, uh, the U.S. tax rate won't look so low anymore. And I th so I, I'm skeptical that we're, when we try to pay for uh, the deficits that we have, I'm skeptical that it's going to come through an increase in the corporate tax rate. Of course, that depends on when it's done and which party is, controls which parts of the government. But I think there's a pretty strong push toward lower tax rates. It was surprising to me that it took us as long as it did uh, to move away from the 35 percent tax rate. But now that we've jumped to 21 percent, I just, I just find, I mean, one, yeah, I could see a 1 percent increase that happened in the 90s. But I don't think anything significant is going to happen in the upward direction. I, I would just say that in relative weight, as I think about uh, the capital deepening puzzle, like why to go negative, uh, and the possible solutions to it that I think that the average tax component is a lot bigger than the marginal tax component. And I think, you know, we'll have evidence five years from now, right? Well, we're going to see what happens, what happens with the stuff Alan mentioned at the end. Uh, is the effect, you know, suggestive that it really is, a, you know, a big part of it is these big, powerful firms with rents that are moving them around and, and hiring foreign workers to do it, but now they're going to be here or what. And so I think that we have to kind of table it. But I do find, uh, to, to emphasize what Alan said a little bit different, that I'm getting a massive amount of phone calls uh, <coughs> from uh, uh, people from other who do economic policy in other countries who have basically said things like, uh, well, now we have to cut our rate again. Uh, and, and have you modeled, uh, you know, the, the response of what you, so, so, so the, I'll leave with two points. Well, one is that, so that suggests that, that the optimist, say, let's just say that Kevin has the optimistic view of Jason, the pessimistic view. The, the, that suggests that the optimistic view has enough purchase that both it's not only affecting the forecasts of the Wall Street firms, but it's also affecting the actions of other governments. But second, I could uh, point you to a paper that Aparna Matter and I wrote once where we uh, basically uh, wrote, did an empirical study to see if you could predict corporate tax reforms. Uh, and uh, we found that even out of sample that we came up with a model that was really quite good. It was sort of like one of those neighborhood type models where if your neighbor has a tax reform, you have to have a tax reform and stuff. And, and so I think it's like on my you know, New Year's to-do list is to rerun that stuff and to, and to see what's going to happen because cause definitely the chatter amongst my colleagues in other countries, you know, the, the CEA, as Jason did, we chaired the Economic Policy Committee at the OECD, and so we've you know, made a lot of friends who do this kind of thing. And, and it does seem like that, that it would be wrong to say there's not going to be response around the world to this. Okay, one last question over here. Yes. So this was a great session, and uh, uh, been, I have done some anal tax policy analysis uh, for the UK economy and uh, also with some of our colleagues uh, you know, for the US economy. Uh, <clears throat> Now the current uh, tax changes are very uh, big, and then uh, as, as the panel uh, in the panel, it came that there are going to be wide-ranging impacts. I mean, it is good news that there are positive impact, and the uh, uh, economy is likely to grow. <coughs> but uh, on the other side, uh, so there are worries uh, on people that it will raise the inequality. Uh, and so uh, how much uh, that will increase, I mean, uh, that we don't know yet. It is uh, uh, maybe the, because of the revenue effect, and so that may be uh, <coughs> upset. But uh, are there a consideration at the moment uh, uh, to address the, uh, to reduce this inequality? Or are, uh, do you think there are some other sides of the tax system, like uh, so uh, indirect taxes or other taxes? Uh, or the sales tax or other tax system that can mitigate for this likely effect of inequality. <coughs> okay, inequality in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> well, Jason thinks it's going to make inequality worse. Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think that, again, the, the, that chart I showed you was the median uh, wage, which has been declining. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that if the capital formation that we're hopeful this will stimulate occurs and the traditional link between that and labor productivity and wages, you know, that we've seen historically is there, then I would think that inequality could go in, in the other direction. Really, for the, for, if it does, it'll be a pretty unusual event uh, in, you know, over the last few decades. Okay.
Thank you so okay, much. Okay, well, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for uh, taking their busy time, time of their schedule to be here. And uh, thanks to everyone for coming to this session. The session is now adjourned.